Okay, Michael, we are recording. Um, All right. And uh, any last questions before we start? Yeah, um, I can't, since I have this full screen, I can't see the, like, the chat window. I mean, if there's people that chat in questions or anything, will you uh, yeah, be able to I, see I will, that? Yeah, I will, I will moderate that. And, um, right. um, yeah, if there's anything you just, that I need, because I, you know, I guess you're the only one that'll stop me with questions, so. <laughs> right, and what'll happen is probably periodically so, I'll just step in and kind of raise a sure. question or whatever. Okay. Yeah, totally. Uh, anytime. Uh, All right. There's a question or you have a question or whatever. I'm happy to okay. um, stop there and talk about it. All right. Well, let's get started then. Hi, everybody. Uh, sure. It's uh, March 20th, um, 2013, or uh, for our presenter, it's March 21st, 2013. He's calling in from Germany. <laughs> um, you are on, uh, this is our, our uh, monthly session, Hands on Ideas. And tonight, uh, we have Michael Allison, uh, who uh, is doing some extremely interesting things in the uh, area of interface um, development, and he is going to walk us through his process, what he does, and how he uses uh, some um, really accessible technology to do some really phenomenal things. And um, uh, I found uh, Michael. Um, through, I believe, I believe this project, uh, Firefall, Firewall, was on Creative Applications uh, Net. Is that? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, that, I think that's where I actually saw it, um, which is a great place to check out stuff like this, and it's got some great resources too. But uh, the point of hands on ideas is we want to um, we we talk to people that are doing interesting things and uh, learn about how they go about it and how we can build on it. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to, uh, there's a comment box, a chat box, and I'll be taking questions. My name is Dan Roos. Uh, I'm the founder of Openly Disruptive, and um, as we go along, Michael will be sharing with you a story. So Michael, um, start. Uh, why don't you start off by telling us kind of how you got into this and, uh, and what you're doing. Sure. sure. Um, well, uh, First of all, thanks, Dan, for, for having me. Um, I'm excited to uh, share a little bit about myself here. Um, let's start with uh, just what we're going to talk about uh, today. Um, the title of our uh, this talk here is Blurring the Line Between Virtual Art and Reality. Um, just to clarify that a little bit, we're not actually going to talk about virtual reality. Um, we're talking more about the uh, hopefully more about the perception of digital art in public space and um, but more importantly than that we're going to talk about uh, my process and uh, the projects I've done and um, hopefully you'll be able to take away some of that so let's look at the expectations this is what I have uh, here for we're going to give you, give you some context about myself um, my background and what inspires me um, uh, generally, I'm going to kind of go, you know, pretty big into just the general things I think about uh, when I'm approaching this sort of stuff, and then try and get down into uh, how that how that uh, works its way into my process um, as I've been doing these projects. It's kind of vague, you know. The process is always changing, and um, it uh, it varies person to person and varies project to project. But uh, I'm going to do my best to give you. Um, the most of what I've learned about the work that I do, and it, it kind of comes out in this one idea uh, called that I've been working with is like translation points. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but that might be uh, a spot that will help you think about interface design, um, or you know, kind of building new as you build new interfaces. Uh, it's kind of an interesting way to, or at least it's the way I've been um, dealing with it. So uh, we're going to talk about some of my projects, Ar uh, arboration and uh, firewall, which Dan mentioned. And if we have time, uh, we'll go through um, and look at this other really interesting project by, uh, called A Haunting by uh, Johan Diedrich, who's a colleague of mine. Uh, it kind of fits in really well with, with these, uh, this selection of projects. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about public space um, uh, and you know, why, why make this sort of stuff and, and um, what's next for, for these projects. and. Uh, uh, hopefully give you some tools uh, or at least talk about some tools if you know 
I'm running out of time. <laughs> um, these, these are the things that I use to, to make this stuff happen. Um, so what I hope you get out of this is um, my approach to media art. Uh, I want you to learn about my process and projects and hopefully you can take that uh, and apply it to uh, the types of things that you're doing and um, go forward from there. So my background is in uh, music performance. Um, for a long time, I'm a sax player. That's uh, is me performing with one of my uh, former groups, and uh, also, and then I got into uh, digital media and doing web design, um, and that was when I was uh, at USC getting my undergrad, and now I'm a uh, master's candidate at uh, NYU's interactive telecommunications program, and that's kind of how I got really started on um, building these. Uh, new music interfaces and uh, working with these technologies. Um, so what inspires me and where I'm going to start is uh, with, with waves. I'm really fascinated and always uh, looking at uh, d different types of wave properties, um, especially in music. You know, we live in a world that's kind of constructed entirely of uh, uh, energy moving through time and that moves through waves, you know. We have this, uh, everything from the known universe is operating on these giant wave patterns down to the quantum field where matter is existing in both particle and wave form. And we have this little spot uh, in between all that which is where all these things come together at this kind of perfect, uh, perfect union, this idea of the just right. It's just this perfect combination of things that allows us to exist and, and, uh, and, and move around. I mean, the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, for example, is another thing that I love and it's something that also represents this idea of the just right. There's, you know, wavelengths that go from unfathomably huge sizes to unfathomably small sizes, but we have this little visible spectrum uh, that we, you know, take in and it defines our entire world uh, in this little, like, sliver of all that there is out there. And so this brings me to these two things that I work a lot with when I'm uh, thinking about ideas and trying to contextualize the stuff that I'm doing and it's sensuality and balance. And uh, like the idea of this just right, there's this that comes in to all the, all the, all the work that I do in interactive uh, media, especially there has to be this sensuality. And we take in the world through our senses. It's, we take through uh, vibrations we, in, in, in the air, and we take in touch through electrical pulses in our, in our nerves and uh, you know, uh, photons through our eyes and, and all that. So it's, we take in the world this sensuality, and I'm trying to balance that uh, with concepts and with design um, to execute these uh, interactive projects. This is kind of like a really broad uh, sense of my framework, but it, these are the kinds of things that I'm thinking about when I uh, get into the to the brass tacks of the work. Because it's good to good to come from, um, and that's what I've been developing over time. So this is kind of my breakdown of of, of my process. And I was putting a question mark because you know this could, <laughs> this kind of changes, but this is the building blocks of, of what I consider my, my process to be. So I just described a little bit for you my framework of where I'm coming from and real basic inspirations that I have that I find in nature and I find in science. Um, and I use kind of that framework to um, start looking at the ideas I have. So. Uh, once you have an idea and you kind of put it into your framework and see how things are going, you start to prototype. And then, uh, you know, it's easy. Uh, sometimes, uh, especially in school, you know, you, you have a tendency to want to skip from prototyping to finalizing your project. But uh, I highlighted two of the most important steps in process, uh, which is play test and iteration. Um, those are paramount uh, in developing something that's, you know, really well put together and something that's actually uh, realizing and balancing both your, your concept and your execution and your design. Um, and then, of course, finalizing, rounding off the corners, um, 
creating a program that's stable, that's going to run <laughs> all the time, and, um, and then documenting. There's this, I didn't learn this until I got into school, uh, but documenting your work is so important, um, especially throughout the entire process. Uh, from 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 the very beginning to to document your to document your progress, because um, it's uh, after you do these things and you do a few of these things, you realize that um, you want the longevity of, of the work that you do. That you put all this time and effort and and love into to live beyond the the just the momentary times and show it. And the best way to do that is, is with documenting now with the internet. And, um, uh, and the easy ability to connect to people, so it's that's that's the best way to get your work out there. Document, document, document. So um, here's what kind of basically how it goes. I have an idea, you know, and I'll think about um, some kind of something that I want to create an interface around, and I'll consider the inspiration that I have for it, and I'll kind of contextualize it in my framework. And that has a lot to do with conceptualization of the ideas, like how deep am I going to, going to go with this certain idea? Is it just a, about showing the technology and showing the interaction? Or is there a deeper level of something that's representing? Or what am I actually saying? And uh, you know, sometimes it's good to research uh, your ideas and see what prior art there is and what other people have done, uh, because you might be able to build off of that work, or you might find more inspiration. Um, these two, I just want to note that these two uh, things here can also become hindrances uh, if you're not too careful. Um, I mean, it's sometimes I've had ideas where I start to look up too much stuff, or I start to get too crazy into the concept, and I end up uh, putting big room, end up just, you know, having to move on because you can't uh, get past these things. So, you know, Michael, talk a little bit about what contextualized. <clears throat> yep. Michael, talk a little bit about the kinds of things that inspire you. You know, so some people that work in, you know, in, 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 in interactive or, or media art are really inspired by imagery. Some people are really inspired by, um, you know, some very human and small and intimate moments that they see and they wonder how they can translate that to more of a digital or mass experience, um, you know, some right. very daily life kinds of things. Talk a little bit about, you know, you, you know, what you see in a day that may or may not inspire you. Well, sound has always been something that's definitely inspired in music, um, being, you know, being the most inspirational thing. Uh, going to going to see live music. Uh, in fact, I just saw yesterday uh, an, a, a Wagner opera uh, here while I was in Germany, and it was uh, it was six hours long, which was a bit long, but uh, the music was just incredible. And when the orchestra, you know, hits those big swells, and uh, it's just like emotion and everything is just so impactful. Um, <laughs> sorry, and. Uh, so it's, it's, it's those moments where, you know, my, the, I'm having, the emotional response that I have meets the, like, intent of the, of, of the music that I'm hearing. And those, those, in those moments, I get kind of the most inspired. Um, but also, I, I draw a lot of inspiration from, from nature and, uh, you know, the kind of the things that are just around me and the environments that I'm in. And, it, and that always changes from place to place. That's... Uh, I've lived a few different places uh, um, throughout my life, and that's they've each had a different impact, you know, on on the kinds of things that I'm, that I'm interested in. Uh, am I answering your question at all? <laughs> yeah. To... So uh, it, it just occurred to me that you know probably in nature you might you know based on some of your work that you might be also you know interested in systems not so much as the imagery or the structures that you see or the forms, but you might be interested in the interplay of things within ecosystems or environments with each other yeah absolutely absolutely I mean we're there's so much connectivity uh, happening in the world and um, I mean yes I'm, of course, I'm always inspired by by imagery but I think that there's so much more uh, happening below images that uh, this is really interesting to me and that's kind of that leads in really nicely to this idea that 
if you take anything away from my process, this idea of translation points, um, the way I look at them are kind of like when you approach these things that inspire you and you can you look through them and you break them down and you try and find one aspect that really uh, grabs you and you can turn that into the entire interface and you can build your entire interface around this one little tiny piece of this piece of inspiration or this idea that you have. So I'll uh, just jump right into Arboration uh, where we can maybe illustrate that a little bit better. Um, so Arboration is a project I did uh, with two, co two of my colleagues, uh, Michelle Cortez and Fang Yu Yang, and they're both extremely uh, talented media artists as well. I would suggest anyone to check out their, their work. You can Google them and find that stuff. But uh, Arboration is a, uh, a music uh, narrative control interface, and um, it works, uh, let's see what I have. Yeah, so it's, you play the keyboard, you play down the um, one octave music keyboard um, style, and as you play it, it's tracking the intervals that you just played and uh, checking whether they're consonant or dissonant, and then using that information to control the, the fate of this uh, digital forest. So there's this forest here, and as you just approach the keyboard and start to play, um, if you're playing consonant intervals, the trees will grow and the birds will fly. And, uh, if you start to play dissonant intervals, uh, it all starts to burn down. And you get this interesting uh, dynamic of things moving from one side of the spectrum to the other as you just uh, play around uh, on the interface. Um, and it is a little more technical definition of what's going on. It's a, a physical musical keyboard. Uh, it's made of finished laser etched plywood and uh, copper plates, and there's an Arduino on the bottom, which is detecting uh, key playing events with capacitive sensing, and that data is collected and uh, parsed by processing and sent with OSC uh, to MaxMSP, Ableton, and Unity 3D. So there's a ton of software in this, in this uh, project, but um, it's just all, it's all connected with Arduino processing and using uh, this uh, protocol called Open Sound Control which has actually nothing to do with sound, but it's uh, kind of like a control message that'll talk between different software and your computer. Um, so what we were trying to do is... By the way, uh, I, I just wanted oh, yeah. to interject here. Um, people are probably wondering, well, how do I see this? And, and uh, we'll have a link on the website to actually go to the site um, after this. Um, and you just saw it on the presentation, but uh, uh, it just doesn't play smoothly to show things that are animated, you know, through a webcast like this, but you'll be able to see it um, after the presentation is over. Yeah, definitely. Take a look. It's just arboration.com. Um, we, we have our documentation video up there and some, some uh, writing and images about it. Um, yeah, so it's just we had this idea to make a, uh, a, a music interface that's a familiar music interface that you are you already know how to use and have it do something that it's kind of unexpected which is control a narrative and I have game here game is kind of a loaded term but it's like a game you know uh, it's kind of a game environment so it's uh, using music to do something that um, maybe it wouldn't normally be used for and as we were going through the initial concept we were toying with whether or not to have it uh, be controlled by certain melodies or have it be these more overarching musical musical constructs that you had to kind of like play along to get right and it started it started to be too much like a game and too much like learning software or we didn't want to create um, something a tool that people were just using to learn how to play music we wanted to create something that was uh, really using music a music theory level to control this story about this little forest. Very simple story, one spectrum. It's <laughs> so a very open-ended, very open-ended experience. Yeah, right? <laughs> so we were trying to boil it all down, and we were able to take music theory down to just this one little part of it, which is you have 12 intervals in the Western music scale, and they're either consonant or dissonant. So there's only 12 intervals, and about half of them happen to be consonant, and about half of them happen to be uh, dissonant. And 
So we took this, it's kind of binary, so we took this little binary part of music theory and translated that into the, into the interface. Um, so this is, this is a picture uh, at the bottom here. This, uh, this is like a nightmare of spaghetti cables. And if I learned anything from doing this project is that you should always uh, practice your wiring, you know, and uh, try and, and, try and uh, get it as tight as possible. But this, you know, this worked for us, and uh, it, it got the job done. And uh, so this is a picture of our initial prototype. Um, we started with the actual MIDI controller keyboard that you see underneath the piano. You see underneath that little uh, piece of wood with the copper, copper stuck on it. Um, and then we moved to that prototype. We built that prototype that, uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse, uh, but this, this is here. Um, and that's using capacitive sensing, which is uh, getting picked up and run through the, through the computer. And we got this little tree on the screen growing and burning down. Um, so we chose this translation point, we, and we designed the whole experience around that point. And what it did is it helped us uh, create design choices for the whole, for the whole, whole thing. Um, since we were only looking at to, an interval is just two notes. So we had to design it in a way that people would be more likely to just play two notes or, or one note, you know, after, after each other, not a whole bunch at, at one time. So we needed to make the key size large enough to where it was um, more likely that you would just press two. We made it a single octave for that same reason, because multiple octaves would have been uh, encouraged more people to play more notes, and that gets more that would make it more confusing. So, so and then um, building it in a way that has the obvious output. So, um, as you play the intervals, it starts to burn down, or the or uh, or the, the sun comes out in an obvious sort of way. Um, so, you know, we had these limitations of uh, of time, uh, the size of well, the art. We used every single input on in our Arduino, which happened to um, be just enough to give us the 12 keys that we needed uh, to make it work. And the <laughs> whole board itself was uh, just uh, small enough to fit inside the laser cutter that would etch out all the, the etched out all the, uh, all the patterns. So we used these limitations and they helped us create these, these design choices. So, we, I mean, we could have expanded it and we could have uh, used two Arduinos and made things more complicated, but um, if I've learned anything, it's that take your limitations and use them to your advantage, and uh, use them to the use them to the fullest. Um, that really that really helps you uh, gives you guidelines when you're when you're making this sort of stuff. So the final product kind of looked like this. Um, it was the keyboard set up in a dim room with the projection of the of the of the environment there on, on the wall, and you just approached it. Uh, and you just started playing, and it, it didn't matter. It doesn't matter what you play. It's just about you exploring and about you playing and um, seeing how how you, how you like the sounds. And it's because the sound sound itself is related to the visual. Like you have this pleasant sounding major chord, and you get this pleasant you know these birds and the sound effects and the trees are growing, and uh, and you start to play these more harsh sounding. Uh, uh, you know, distant intervals, and everything starts to burn down, and it uh, becomes this kind of connected experience. So, in my process, and I think in, it should be a part of any process, you have to kind of gauge your success of how, how things uh, are going. So, what I do is, I, as I described uh, before, these two things that I'm always kind of searching for um, in the work that I do is sensuality and balance. So, uh, the sensual experience of this whole thing. Um, I feel like we nailed pretty good. Yes, uh, we, got, we got that pretty good. Um, the board was really pleasant to look at. It felt great to touch. The finish on it was very nice. Uh, the, the graphics on the screen were all running really well. The sound was reactive. Um, viscerally, it was all very connected. And uh, so, we, so we had that, that going. And that leads into the balance. So all those aspects were balanced. But we only, but we kind of missed a little bit on um, the music 
theory aspect. It's kind of complicated to just explain to someone the idea of consonants and dissonance that doesn't know music theory. So it's, you know, when balancing your concepts with your actual uh, execution, it's, it's really, it's a fine interplay there. But so we did okay on that. And you always have to gauge your, the, the audience reaction. For this project, we had, we had a really nice reaction <coughs> from everyone that used it, especially kids. Um, they may not have been getting exactly what was going on with the control, but uh, they love to bring the forest down. So that was definitely fun to watch. <laughs> People, yeah, I know. I don't know if it's, it's, it's scary or, or not, but they certainly, I mean, the reaction, uh, seeing people light up when they see these like crazy changes happening on screen is, is really fun. And uh, a big part of gauging your success that I, I like to include is this idea of follow-up. Um, and that relies heavily on your documentation. Uh, well, we, we didn't really, for this project, we kind of missed the mark on that one. That's why I have question marks there, because we didn't really follow up too much with it. We just kind of put it out there uh, on the web and kind of let it sit. But uh, what I learned from later projects is that you have an opportunity to let your, take your projects to the next level <clears throat> by actively kind of putting them out there and sending them out places. And, um, you know, if you have good, good documentation together, it really helps. So. We kind of missed it on follow-up, but uh, that will lead us into um, Firewall here, which is, uh, we did have great follow-up on, and it really led us, well, led me to this talk today. Um, so you can see more about Firewall at this link at the top. It'll be uh, on, the, on the site after, after the talk here. But uh, I created Firewall with, uh, with my partner, Aaron Sherwood, and um, we made this big spandex push screen that uses a connect to uh, the depth of how far you're pushing into it. And as you press in and the tension on the fabric becomes uh, greater and greater, there's this uh, really vibrant explosion of light that's happening and the sound. Uh, there's this piano playing that gets faster and more intense. The more you press in, the more tension there is. It's this really combined experience of um, pushing into this fabric and having all this tension happen and then you release it and you start to get this uh, expression, expressive play over, over how the light and the sound is all happening. Um, so just to reiterate, here's the text from our website. Uh, it's a stretch sheet of spandex that has a performance membrane that when pushed into creates a fire-like visual and expressively plays music. Uh, the further you press into the membrane, the faster and more intense the piano music becomes. Uh, the depth of information is captured using a Kinect camera, and the visuals are created with processing, and the sounds are created with Max MSP. So what we set out to do was just basically control audio visuals with a fabric touchscreen. Um, the idea to do this spawned out of <coughs> a couple of things. It, it was a progression um, of things. I started with an idea to make a really big latex wall that would sweat when you uh, exercise in front of it. <laughs> so <laughs> wow. I toyed with that idea for a while. I know, right? It couldn't be further from what the firewall actually is. Um, but I, I bought <clears throat> latex and I toyed around with the idea and I realized that that was not really going to go anywhere. It was really kind of a gross idea to begin with and it would have been messy and co too complicated for, for the effect. So. I started experimenting, um, what do I have here? Oh yeah, so I started experimenting with using the Kinect and um, projecting back onto the, onto the fabric, which, yeah, or onto the latex, which you can see here, this is my initial experiment. And uh, meanwhile, Aaron um, and his wife have a, um, like a kind of media performance group, uh, and they do uh, these dances with uh, projection mapping and interactive uh, music and generative stuff, and um, actually, we're just, a, piece, just a uh, just a plug for Aaron. Actually, we're going to have Aaron in another session later on this year, where he talks about he's going to talk about doing these little pop up uh, projection mapping things uh, around movement um, on the street in the city. Um, so he does, yeah, he does some really interesting things. I would think this is an interesting collaboration. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Uh, if you're out there listening in the internet land, check out uh, Aaron's, uh, Aaron's talk coming up uh, in the future. Um, 
yeah, so he does all this interesting work, and I knew that, and we always wanted to work together. So uh, it was just, they were putting together this performance in June. Uh, it was natural for me to, uh, you know, approach him and say, hey, like, I'm developing this um, kind of weird push screen sort of thing. Maybe we could uh, build something for the dancers to use in your, in your performance. And so we, so we had some long talks, and uh, he, was, he told me all about what the theme of the, of the, of the performance is. It's called uh, Mizalu, and it's about uh, this space that we occupy in life that's between life and death. And we're always piling on more and more things in our lives to uh, keep us from seeing those, those two aspects that are so, uh, so much a part of how, our, how we live. And so the firewalls represent these doors that you see uh, into. Well, the firewall that uh, that you, that you're all familiar with is the is the is the portal that you look through to see death. And the more you press into it, the more you try to understand it, and the more you, the deeper you go into it, uh, you realize that you're never actually going to see what's on the other side. And it's this membrane that is is keeping you in this reality. So. Uh, we decided that we should make this big portal and this big sort of wall or doorway, and uh, that's kind of where we started. And we, this translation point here that I, that I want to talk about with firewall musical expression, we didn't actually get to that until a little bit later. So we, we started with just the technology in this case, uh, whereas in Arboration we started with um, more, more of that translation point and that idea of what the interface would be. Uh, here in firewall we started with Literally just experimenting with materials, which is um, which is a great thing to do. And you know, we just started using things that we could we could find. And here's my here's my friend Sam uh, testing it out with his face. Uh, so what I was doing here is just I had a, a simple thresholding uh, sketch on processing that would represent the different thresholds of depth with these different uh, with a sequence of colors. So the further you pressed into it, the more green the uh, the ring god. So it was just using a. Uh, Michael, could you that, just uh, really quickly? Not everybody is going to be familiar with processing. You know, um, absolutely. Uh, can you just talk a little bit about what it is and how the libraries work and things so that. Uh, absolutely, you know, absolutely. Because I don't. So processing is a, uh, a creative coding environment um, that that is uh, built on Java and. It's all text-based, so you're uh, only writing uh, text to get to get visual output, and, and there's a whole language in six. Um, but it's actually pretty. It may seem scary to be think, to think about coding and uh, programming, but it's you know the the fundamentals of it are, are pretty basic. There's about five or six concepts that if you can get those, you can you can pretty much launch into anything. And, Processing wraps it up and makes everything as easy as possible to get to to get in there, write a couple lines of code, and you suddenly have visual output. And uh, people that are uh, extremely smart and generous have made a lot, a lot of libraries that you can use to interface with things like the Connect or with Arduino or um, with other kinds of cameras or uh, just pretty much you name it. And it's somebody's out there working on it. Um, and you just kind of import them and then read the documentation online about what things you can do with it and you just start to use the exam copy from the examples and start to build stuff it's uh, that's I mean that's how I that's how I learned how to work with connect was using uh, uh, open connect which was uh, written by uh, Dan Schiffman uh, who's actually written a lot of great uh, books on processing uh, learning processing if you want to learn it there's a book called learning processing that he wrote that is an awesome resource to get started. Um, and these so are some really yeah. amazing tools that, you know, between, you know, Connect, you know, made by Microsoft. And, you know, and I don't think anybody, you know, five to ten years ago would have ever thought that, you know, Microsoft was producing something that, you know, was going to be used by this many people to kind of hack and make all their own things out of. But really interesting if way they to explore, explore space and volume and time, you know. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. If they, you know... The funny thing is, if they did know that it was possible to do all this stuff with Connect, I, I don't even know if they would have uh, locked down their software more or, or something. But the fact is that the community of people 
that were interested in the technology and open source minded were able to take it and get it out there so fast that Microsoft had no choice uh, or there was you know, no other option. So it's just uh, it's amazing what you can do with these tools. Yeah, and if you're um, and if you're listening to this and you know, and you're a musician and you know nothing about any of these things, um, check in your community for um, a hacker space or a maker space, because there absolutely. are people there that are playing with Arduino and Connect and things like that, and they'll understand this language. And uh, um, these are things that there are people in your community that you just probably don't know yet that would be that would love to work on projects like this with you. Totally, totally, and you just you can even just Google for uh, you know using processing and connecting. You'll find so many resources and there's books and, and all kinds of things you can. Um, and processing is open there. source, so the whole developing environment and everything is free to download. Absolutely, it's it's that's the best thing. That's the best thing about processing. I should mention is that's totally free. Um, a lot of these open source tools are are, are free, and the, and the hardware itself, a connect is only like hundred bucks or something. It's pretty, pretty yeah. cheap. Uh, sorry, that. sorry, we got on a tangent, but tell us more. So this is so you're in your prototyping process, or you're playing with it and seeing what you're going to do here. We iterated and play test and iterated. This is actually a play test here. You can see the Connect camera down there on that tripod and the latex, and we decided the latex was the wrong material. It didn't have the right feel. Uh, the, sensa the you know the sensuality of it was really not in the zone for me. And uh, so we, we experimented with other fab other things, and spandex came to mind, which is here we started working with spandex. I went to a place in New York called Spandex House, and I felt about a million different kinds of spandex <laughs> before we settled on this one, uh, which I didn't even know there were so many kinds of spandex. But uh, it was really it was really fun uh, to explore the different materials. Uh, so kind of the evolution of just the general process. We had this had this crazy wacky latex sweaty wall idea that did not work out. But we started I started experimenting with Connect, and uh, really the magic happened when I was collaborating um, with Aaron, and we started getting more deeper into the uh, uh, concept of, of what we were doing, and we let that guide us uh, at every stage through all this iteration and frustration, because uh, we, we ran into a lot of issues calibrating the Connect and the projector. Um, because these things kind of have to line up, because they're both like eye eyeballs, really, in a way, you know. And if they're not looking at the same thing the same way, the image is off, uh, and the and the, just the experience isn't right. So we took a long time getting those things uh, together, and then we had the, our near finished firewall with some last tweaks, turned it into the one that you see uh, in the video. And uh, the real the real big show off of the firewall will, will be at the Mesa Loop performance uh, in. In June in, in New York, um, when we were, we were having two of these, uh, and now they're eight feet tall, and, and they're you know, it's just bigger and <laughs> crazier. Um, but we returned to the concept at every stage, and that was a real important part of this process. And uh, uh, Aaron's wife Kiori was a big helper in keeping us on track, uh, as you know, we ran into issues. Yes, yeah, so this is Aaron, and this is his website. Um, like Dan was saying, definitely check it out. Check out his talk. And uh, Praying Tigers is the group that's uh, putting on this, this dance performance in June. Uh, so we got down to this. Uh, so this is the final product here of, of what we had, what we showed. Um, and now it's you know now it's a little bit bigger than this, um, but it's still using the same exact stuff. So what did we? So kind of what I took out of it is that you know we reached this point where the balance of all of these, uh, the balance of everything, the sensuality and the concept and everything, uh, was just right for this project, and that's what makes it so special. Um, the uh, the touch, uh, the audio visual response to the touch, uh, is immediately understandable to the point where you know, it doesn't take a, a big leap of your mind to 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 think you know. What is this thing doing? And it's you know about trying to keep things keep things simpler. Um, and so, what's next for for Firewall is like I said, the, the Mizlu um, performance is, is going to be the next step for, for that specific uh, design. But we're doing new installations. Uh, we're working with uh, some other um, spaces uh, around the, around around the country. That are, we're going to do different size. Uh, installations of it in different content, but it's all basically the same principle, which is just 
using this fabric and using a connect and, and, and pushing into it to, to give you information that you can do whatever you want with. That's the beauty of these tools like processing and open frameworks and uh, max MSP is that it's just numbers and data and you can kind of do whatever you want with it. Your imagination is, is the only uh, limitation on that. And uh, I want to talk a little bit about um, the, uh, the connect and gesture uh, because the connect is a, is it gives you the capability of tracking gesture and using uh, physical gesture in your interfaces and though that seems really awesome like you can make a drum machine where you're just putting your hands in the air and you should totally try that you should totally do that <laughs> but uh, what, one, one thing about uh, you know connect is that it's kind of like the values get really finicky when you start moving fast and you know the tracking is, is, is one thing and uh, it can be a little bit all over the place what I found and what Aaron and I found by using uh, the spandex as uh, kind of a limiting force on your gesture, we got a lot better results with the connect and a lot smoother values. Um, oh, interesting. The, the fabric limits you to a range that's not super big and because it puts resistance on you when you push into it, it kind of forces your gesture to be more um, purposeful and more smooth and we end up, you know, on that on the other side in the, in the program, get to use these more smooth values without having to figure out a way to smooth them out, um, um, you know, through through the code. So it, it so uh, constraints so constraints work for the actual interaction side as well. The actual yeah, user. It's, it, it was it was both. You know, it, it, it made for a great interaction. It feels good to touch and like you, you push into it. It's really uh, really sensational when you touch it. And then for us on the other side, yeah, it was like this. Magical, like oh man, that totally made the connect work really well for the for the project, um, and that's right there is the power of balance in these things when you're um, making them. It's just always keeping back in your mind, like what is you know, am I going too crazy? Am I adding too much to this? You know, what is the minimum I need to do to get the maximum out of the experience? And then uh, and that's kind of the illusion of simplicity, like. Uh, the more minimal you can go, sometimes you get the better results. Um, and that, that's not all, all the time, but that's, for this project, that's, that's what we definitely learned. Um, and follow up, you know, we put together this video uh, that you can find on Vimeo, um, and it just, uh, you know, it, it, it took off because it was good documentation, and um, we had, you know, the project kind of, had this night, this this great balance and this great uh, uh, aesthetic, you know. And it was uh, we sent it out to places like Creative Applications. We actually sent it to them, and they put it up. And from there, it just started to grow and grow. So, uh, if there's anything to be <laughs> learned from Firewall, it's send your projects out and develop relationships with these blogs and just uh, you know, it's uh, it's definitely like you should always make stuff for you and. Um, for yourself, but it's, you know, this is the only way the community gets bigger and grows more and we all learn about uh, each other and each other's work is by getting stuff out there. It's important to, to spread, spread, um, spread it just so it's just so it's out there, you know. And uh, another thing we learned is listen to your audience. When we started showing the firewall, we learned a lot of things that we could use it for and things that we didn't even realize about it. Um, for instance, uh, it's really it's got this therapeutic quality, and there's this uh, type of therapy for autism, uh, which is sensory therapy. And so now we're looking in with some people into uh, maybe developing this sort of technology into into something that can be built into a nonprofit or something like that. So it's you know, and that's all from listening to the to the reactions of people um, using this stuff. And always, you know, I say continue iterating, and even now I'm like, oh man, I. Sometimes I hate going back to work on the firewall more, but because it's such sometimes it's a, it's a pain and um, it's been such a long process. But uh, you know, always can try and continue iterating because you know your ideas will just keep growing the more that you work on them. Uh, you'll find new inspiration in, in the work you've already done. Um, so uh, yeah, so that's 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 the piece on firewall, um, and it kind of comes down to this. 
uh, reinvent the ordinary. You know, we just took these things that are readily available. I mean, not that spandex is super readily available, but you know, it's just a basic material, and we put it together um, with these processing to open source and uh, interfaces with the Connect. You know, I mean, we're able to. Um, kind of reinvent the way you might think about uh, a touch interface. One thing I didn't actually talk about um, that, I, that I wanted to mention is uh, keeping, in, keeping this theme of translation points. The thing that, uh, that, we, that we were able to look at with this, that ultimately we ended up uh, getting to this point that we translated into the, what the interface really is, is, is this idea of expression and musical expression. Um, there's a space between a composition and the performance of that composition where the, the person performing it has to put in their own expression. Like a piano player would sit down to a pre-written piece of music and it would be different depending on who was playing it. You know, They put their own uh, emphasis on certain phrases and whatnot. So that's kind of what the firewall does. It allows you to put your own um, expression into the piece of music and into the visual uh, by you know, putting your body into it and, and, and changing the way you move. And that's another reason that the interface works so well is that it's uh, not going too far in, in letting, um, in making it a, a, like a, cool, a tool for writing music, but it's just a tool for expressing music. So we took this small piece of, of what it is to, to play, play music and, and turn that into the, into the interface. We translated that up into the interface. Okay. Um, Michael, can you talk just a little bit about, you know, so I think one of the things that's so powerful about just even the images of Firewall, you can't even hear the sounds, um, but when you just see a still image, <laughs> you just kind of get that, oh, I'm distorting this fabric, and it's like the fabric of space-time and everything, and I can quickly imagine, you know, just seeing that visual, how discordant or, or loud or, you know, kind of a cacophony, you know, what would happen from that? That you know, and that, that I can get. Oh, I can move my hand around up and down in this space. You know that those are all things that I quickly get. Talk a little bit about what that actual sound like and how you uh, made those kind of musical choices. Sure, sure. We actually started at a spot. Um, well, Aaron, Aaron made made the music for Firewall, and he he did. Uh, he, he's he's awesome at the Max MSP, and uh, he had this one really amazing sounding patch, but it was kind of abrasive and had this, uh, and it was really, uh, we were controlling the pitch with, with the depth. And it didn't exactly match the visual, you know, it was, although the visual is very chaotic and has this flowing chaoticness to it, uh, it didn't quite match. It was this kind of high-pitched, uh, kind of distorted sound. But then, uh, and we were, we were not sure, you know, we weren't really feeling like we had the visuals lined up really well with the sound. And then he came in with this comp piano composition that he, that he had been working on, and he put it into uh, a, an algorithm that speeds up with, with, the, uh, with, with the data. So it starts at zero. There's zero tempo, uh, so there's no notes playing. But once you touch the fabric, this arpeggiated pattern of piano notes begins to slowly play, and as you press in further, it starts to speed up the notes gain uh, intensity and it becomes this like flowing uh, pattern of chords that just you can constantly you can just listen to it over and over it has this uh, it's 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 a it's a repeating pattern but the chord structure the, is written in a way that it just makes it uh, you know you can listen to it on loop forever it's really nice but it's about how intense it gets on the, the further the further in you press in. As you start to let off, it slows down and it gets more quiet. And then, right as you let go of the fabric, there's nothing. I mean, there's no sound. It's just the vibrating lines again. Uh, it gives you control over how this thing is. Is this composition, which is already predetermined, but it's about how it's performed, and you can kind of see how important and how much expression. In music affects the emotional quality of it and how much it uh, can change what the real um, impact of the piece is because uh, if it was just straight on uh, or played played straight away it, you know it would not have the same emotional quality as if it was 
if it had these dynamics of just being soft and slow and then speeding up and getting faster and more intense. Um, and so yeah, that's that's what I wish uh, I wish I could just play it for you. You know, that makes it, <laughs> that yeah. would make it easier. Well, you have to go to the website and see the video. So yeah, you go to the website, check it out. Yeah, it's a short, short, short video. Uh, oh wait, I'm going the wrong way here. But uh, yeah, so that's I mean, I guess if there's anything you can take away, it's that uh, you should try all kinds of things. I mean, nothing is off limits to 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 what you're trying and to, you know, you might only have access to certain things, but use those things, you know, don't feel like you can't do something just because you don't have access to something or uh, you should always take advantage of your limitations. And I've, I've been learning that uh, when you're only working with, you know, when you're working with your imagination and anything's possible, it's actually good to have some limits uh, so you can, so you can test those boundaries and use those things. Um, we're running out of time. Uh, yeah, I was so going to say, we have a I few questions. This, this project, but, so can you yeah, just I'd briefly talk about this? And questions. yeah, I was gonna say if you could just briefly talk about this project. And yeah, sure. I'll just sum it up. And just like, yeah, totally, totally. So this is a really cool project. You should definitely check out. Um, it's called A Haunting. It's by Johan Diedrich. Uh, he did he did this last uh, last year a few months ago, and um, it's these two sets of of poles that you can see here. And uh, when some it works on capacitive sensing the same way that the arboration keyboard does. When the person touches one set of poles and another person touches the other set of poles and then they touch each other, they complete this circuit and the uh, amount of touch that they're applying to each other creates music and, and light in the room. It controls these actual incandescent lights that get brighter and as the music, uh, as the sound uh, gets more intense. It's, it's a real, you should definitely look it up. It's, it fits right into this idea of Taking a little point about um, taking a little point of what the experience is of uh, performing music, and then translating that up into an interface. In this case, uh, the translation point is touch and contact. When you when you're playing music uh, and expressing music, you always have to you're using your hands. Well, typically, unless you're singing, uh, you're using your hands to uh, get in there and manipulate the in instrument, and you have this. Uh, really intimate touch relationship with with the sounds that you're making. And that's exactly what Johan did. He took that touch, that intimacy of, of touching and blew that up into this big interface where depending on how you're touching, you know, uh, another person, uh, it just it is what is controlling the music. And it's just so uh, it's sensation. I have written sens sensual to the max because it's just all about this touch and uh, it get, it's like it, it was just a really phenomenal thing to see. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll happily take some questions. I have some more stuff about this normalcy field. It's kind of it's kind of heady, but uh, yeah, I'll t definitely take questions. So talk a little bit. Um, uh, some people um, have a uh, you know when you talk about iteration and everything, but then you're also trying to do work that at some point you know whether it's for a performance or for a gallery or whatever, it, there's an opening night. Right, but um, so yeah. in your process, you actually said finalize. You know, how do you know what does finalize mean? Is it well the deadline is met, and so now we're done iterating, or is it that you get to some kind of point where there's some, uh, you know, a little bit of sense of stasis or something where you know where it's a resting point? Talk about how do you get to knowing that you're at that point. Sure, sure. There's a couple ways to think about it. Um, I, the ideal situation is when you've been iterating and you finally get to a point where you are personally happy with, uh, with your project. And a lot of the whole process I've been talking about, I focus a lot on what makes myself and, and not any other benchmarks. Like I am my, my own benchmark maker in terms of um, the work that I do. I try not to compare too much to prior art or, uh, my, or colleagues at all. I just really try to focus on just me. So that's ideal, right? But in practicality, once you get something that is looking good and is stable, you can start. You can start to finalize um, because you know some of these things. Like if you're working on a project with Arduino and it, it's starting to work, you know it works consistently and it's uh, running all the time. It does what it's supposed to do. The sensor values are always coming in roughly the same. 
uh, you know, you've tried it out in a few different locations and you've play tested it a few times, um, and you're and you're and, you, and you're there and you've got your little proto you've got your prototype and a breadboard and all these little jumper cables that are plugging everything in. That's you're not you're almost there. You've got to tighten that up so you know you're, you're hard soldered your connections. Uh, you've you've put it in a box, you know. But at, at a certain point, um, you run out of time, you know. If, you, if especially if you have deadlines, um, and you just got to say, you know, this is going to be it, and uh, and that's the deal. That's kind of the unideal situation, and that's kind of the more te once it's technically stable. That's a great time to start polishing it up and putting that last coat of coat of wax on there, and you know, <laughs> I did, you know, metaphorically <laughs> putting that last coat of wax on there and getting it all nice and shiny and every, all the connections uh, finalized. Um, there's, you know, it's interesting. An another question uh, came up: uh, somebody oh, yeah, with background in user experience, you know, um, <clears throat> talks about you know four things that use more traditional PC or computer kinds of interactions. So keyboard, mouse, that kind of thing. You know, one of the things that really creates the sense of, uh, um, of, of a dialogue of, of true interactivity with your machine is, you know, low latency so that, you know, there's no latency, there's not things getting in the way of it. You know, when you're doing things like using spandex and using other fabrics and, um, and things, uh, you know, that sense of sensuality that you talked about, you know, is that, you know, is it really the processing and the algorithms and things and how, um, how well that's done to kind of mask the fact that there's all these things in between, you know, talk about the, the balance between the, you know, the, the code that you're doing and the, the physical aspects of the interaction and creating that sense oh, of sensuality. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that person is right on the money. Um, when you're when you're making these things and you have physical input, like the person's got to do something to make this thing work, if it doesn't happen right away, you can really totally lose someone in the experience, and they're, they'll they'll be oh yeah well that that microsecond of latency will just like can totally take you out of and the in, uh, and in the case of sound, I mean a micro or a millisecond is a big deal. I mean that's how you determine placement in space and things. That's how your brain works. So a millisecond really is a big deal. Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. When we, um, <laughs> you know, it's funny, as I get more and more into uh, the programming and especially the visual programming, uh, it's speed becomes such a, such a crazy thing to wrangle. Uh, the more processing thing, or more, you know, processes you add to your, to your code, the, the slower it can be, and uh, you know, learning the ways that actual, you know, the computer science ways to do these things is really, really crazy and really intense. Um, the best thing to do is to kind of work, like I, you know, like I guess I've been saying, work with your limitations and get the maximum bang for your buck by by uh, not going too far, but maybe. Uh, Balancing your performance versus what you're getting on the output because you have to have low latency um, If you're having this one-to-one -one interaction where somebody's touching something and something's happening Unless there's unless delay is a part of it. You've got to be as fast as possible to keep people engaged uh, Mentally right. just because you start to disconnect like you're saying Your brain just is like hey these aren't this isn't happening in real time or something like this is a computer It's not the magic of experience that I'm supposed to have. Um, we have time for it's one more. I, I wanna, yeah, it's hard to do uh, to, to balance yeah. those things in, in the code, but you know, but, but, Google, but, Google will help. Yeah. <laughs> Latency, yeah. Um, one last question, um, and this is for me, so I'm, I'm just kind of curious, you know, you've been talking about, um, in, especially in Arboration and, well, actually in all three projects that you've been talking about, you know, a sense of the the musician's experience is a big part of your work and I'm just curious do you think that you know people that have musical training or have you know are, are musicians in some way get your work more quickly than general audience or is it pretty universal you know is you, you know clearly people get to it eventually but um, how much of this is you know people being led into this world of, of, of musicians? Well, it's funny. There's a contrast between the two projects. Um, in Arboration, 
the, the people that come from a music background get it almost immediately, and it takes a little bit longer for, for a non-musician to kind of understand what the actual control is. And it's, you know, it's not the most obvious thing. The balance there was a little bit screwed up, like I was saying. But uh, for, for Firewall, it's completely the opposite. Um, the people that are non-musicians non almost respond even, even greater because it's so immediate and, you know, they know what, you know, what the music, they know what music is, you know, and how it works. And all they're doing is pushing in there and it's suddenly, they feel like they have control over, over this music and they're actually making it. And that's, you know, for people that do music or don't do music, that's like the immediate sensation is I am performing this music and I am in control of the performance. And that's, you know, by taking out the need to compose uh, from the equation. So the composing is done, you know, you're just playing it, you know, that might not sound as appealing, but when you put it into, you know, it's about the design choices that you make for your interface, but, um, you know, that's what, I think that's what makes it really universal is the idea of composing music is really scary to a lot of people. And so is the idea of performing it, I guess, but when you don't have to worry about composing and you're just expressing it, uh, I think that that's a more universal uh, idea because we all feel emotion. Well, most people feel emotions when they hear music and to be in control of, of that emotional quality of it is like uh, pretty universal. I think. Cool. Well, that about wraps it up. Um, just a reminder that uh, come back to openlydisruptive.org and uh, be a page with all of the links, um, a copy of the presentation and uh uh, we will edit this webcast down into some short pieces, um, and uh, those will be posted there so that you can uh, check out the work. But, um, Michael, if people want to see Firewall in performance, uh, uh, do you know the details of that for June? Yeah, it's, it's going to be, I should have put them up here. It's June 6th and 7th at the uh, Tribeca Performing Arts Center in New York, and uh, you can find more information about that. Um, I'll put a link on my website. Uh, which is here, michaelpallison.com, and you can definitely email me uh, at uh, michaelpallison at gmail.com with any questions, or if you want to uh, uh, get more technical with some, with some stuff, or you have you know uh, anything you want to know about my work or help with anything, I'm I'm, ha I'm happy to help you out. Great. Well, thank you very much, and uh, thanks for staying up late for us in Germany, and uh, thank you everybody for being with us tonight. Um, have a great time. And, uh, uh, one last thing is if you do some work, um, that kind of gets inspired by Michael's work, make sure that you let us know so that we can share that. Um, but, uh, good luck making and creating. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Right.